saw the, you know, the, the, the homework check page. Here's what they did. All right, so you got y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. This is the, the, the letter y, the variable y, an actual y value from a point, okay, from this point. This would be m, the slope. This would be x, the variable x. This would be an actual number, like an x value from a point. Let's see what they did. Y minus 2, is that right? Y minus, that is a 2, is it? Okay. E equals 3, is the slope 3? It certainly is. Uh, X minus, minus what? Negative 4. Negative 4. Minus negative 4. That's what the X value is. So it should read X minus plus. Minus negative or plus would be like uh, the shortened form of that. X plus 4. So then we distribute the 3, we get 3x plus 12, uh, we would get plus 2, so we would get plus 14. That's what we should get. Okay. Now that's a 20. Uh, okay. Pick one of the other 30 or 34, they're both just two points finding the 34. 34. All right. So they want us to find the equation of the line. And they're giving us a point, that's pretty clear. And then they're telling us it's parallel to some other line, right? We only care about what we can tell about the line we're going to write an equation about, right? So what do we know about the line that we want to write an equation about? It has a slope of negative 4, so it's just parallel. Ah, does this equation y equals negative 4, x plus 1, does that equation tell you the slope of, of that line over there? Yeah, it's at y equals mx plus b, m is the slope. So I can quickly see if this slope is negative 4, that's the slope of, of this line. Slope. Right. And this line is parallel, the line that goes through negative 3, negative 5, it must have the same slope. And that's it. That is all that tells you. It doesn't tell you anything else about the line except for the slope because parallel lines, the only thing that they have in common is the same slope. And they have nothing else to do with each other. So that just tells you that the slope is negative 4. So now what do we have? We have a point and a slope, just like number 18, just like any problem where you have a point and a slope. So we could uh, plug it into the slope-intercept form, solve for b, plug b back in, and there we have it. Or you do the point-slope form. I'll do the point-slope form. So that's y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 y minus negative 5 equals negative 4 times x minus negative 3. That's y plus 5 equals negative 4 times x plus 3. y plus 5 equals negative 4 x minus 12. Subtract 5 from both sides, negative 4 x minus 17. about these? This one? This here? Here, I'll do slope intercept form really, really fast. Okay. Uh, negative 5 equals negative 4 times negative 3 plus b. I don't know what b is, so I'm going to solve for it. Negative 5 equals 12 plus b minus 12 minus 12. Negative 17 is b, so I put b back 
into this form. And I know what m is, so y equals negative 4 x minus 17. Another way to go about it. As always, stop me if you have a question. So that's right, right about then is when I felt like we could move on. If I'm ever wrong, just stop me. Let me know. OK. So it's very similar, isn't it? Would you agree? Very similar to number 20. If even one person can shake or nod their head. OK, great. Uh, it's very similar. We have a point. We have another line. But this line is perpendicular to that line. OK? Um, what is the slope of this line? Slope is always the number times x. Do you see an x? See any x's? No. no. So if I were to write this as y equals mx plus b, clearly b is negative 2 plus negative 2, minus 2, whatever. If I had to put an x there, what would I have to multiply by x so that there's no x? 0. There's your slope. Okay. y equals 0x. Minus 2. Okay. So what's the slope of this line? If it's perpendicular. Opposite reciprocal. Here, let me, let me back up. Let me make up, an, make up another problem. And then we'll come back to this real quick. Let's say it goes through 5, 7. And it's perpendicular to this guy, y equals... Negative, sorry, 5 thirds x plus 2. Okay, so let's just say it's that. Instead of that other thing, that y equals just a number. If it's perpendicular to this line, the only thing that I can pull out of that, the only information I can pull out of the equation of this line, if this line is perpendicular, is something about the slope. And what did we just say? If, if two lines are perpendicular, their slopes are what? Opposite reciprocals. So this slope is negative 5 thirds. So this slope must be positive 3 fifths. Now I have a point in the slope. y minus 7 equals 3 fifths times uh, x minus 5. y minus 7 equals 3 fifths x minus 3 fifths times 5 is going to be 3 y equals 3 fifths x uh, plus 4. See what we're doing? We're just saying they're perpendicular, so they must have opposite reciprocal slopes. Now, what does that mean here? If this slope is 0, then this slope must be what's the reciprocal of 0? OK, negative 1 over 0. What's the reciprocal of 3? 1 over 3. What's the reciprocal of 4? 1 over 4. What's the reciprocal of 5? 1 over 5. What's the reciprocal of negative 2? Negative 1 over 2. The reciprocal of any number is just 1 over that number, right? Because these are all 3 over 1, 4 over 1, 5 over 1, negative 2 over 1. The reciprocal is just 1 over that number, right? What kind of number is that? Imaginary. It certainly is problematic. Error. Okay, put in your calculator, it gives you an error. I should tell you something. Your calculator is fairly capable. That's not smart, but it is capable. And it does tell you that there's an error. What is that error? What? Irrational. What does that mean? What's the word syntax mean? You guys know? Undefined. You cannot divide by zero. There is no do it. Don't look up one divided by look up anything divided by zero. Look it up in the dictionary. And I'm being kind of facetious here. If you look it up in the dictionary, the definition for divided by zero is blank. There is no definition for dividing by zero. It doesn't make any sense mathematically. It's impossible. Okay? 
for lots of different ways, lots of different explanations, but suffice it to say, you can't divide by zero. Right? Uh, so, what does a line look like if it has this kind of slope? This line exists, but its slope doesn't exist. What? But the fact that its slope doesn't exist or that its slope is undefined oh. tells us something. Yeah. What kind of a line can have an undefined slope? Straight up and down, rise over run, right? Let's say I'm at a point on the line, and I want to follow the rise over the run. All right, but let's just follow these directions. They're kind of nonsense, but all right, so we go down one, and over how much? Zero. Zero. So the next point must be right below the previous one, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. So it's a vertical line. OK, it's vertical. I'm like halfway there. It needs to go through this point, doesn't it? This point right here, negative 6, 2. How about if I put my y-axis right here, my x-axis right here, and I make this negative 6. Negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it's a vertical line, and it has an undefined slope. And it, does it go through negative 6, 2? Yeah, it goes through negative 6 any y value. Negative 6, 2. Negative 6, negative 12. Negative 6, positive 45. It goes through all of the points where x is negative 6. So I just said it. x is negative 6. As long as x is always negative 6, that's our line. Remember, we talked about it before. Undefined slope. Defined M means vertical, vertical line. Zero slope, horizontal line. Undefined slope, vertical. It goes through negative 6, 2. Abby, did you have another question from that one? We look at this guy here, and we figure out it's got a zero slope. You're good on that? Yeah. All right. If it has a zero slope, and this other line is perpendicular, its slope must be the opposite reciprocal. Let me take the opposite reciprocal of zero. It's kind of nonsense. Like negative? Like is zero positive? No, zero is not. It is just the number between negatives and positives. That's what zero is. So to say negative one over zero, it's kind of silly, but if it gets the point across, we want to look at the slope as being this. We go down one and over zero. Right? It reminds us that an undefined slope means a vertical line. What's well, a vertical line that has to go through a point negative six to two, negative six comma two, and it certainly does. Maybe that negative six two is right there. Our vertical lines have the equation x equals number. x equals the number that it, that it goes through. It goes through negative six. There's our equation, x equals negative six. That's all that has to be true for this line, is that x is negative six. All right, I have two points. I want to write this equation. What is something I can find out about that equation? With those two points. You can find the slope. We remember that m equals y2 minus y1, so x2 minus x1. All we have to do is call this point, say, 2, and this point 1. It doesn't matter. And it's 2 minus negative 4. Don't worry. Forget about that. If I have to subtract a negative, I don't want to miss out on that. Negative 1 minus 3, we get 6 over negative 4, negative 3 halves. And that's the slope. And now we have, we have a slope and two, points. and two points. So it's not that we have to use both of those points, it's that we have a choice between either of the two points we want to use. 
Remember from the previous problems, a point and a slope is sufficient. One point and one slope is the very least that I need. Okay. So I'll use this slope, of course, that is the slope. And uh, maybe I'll use this point. They both have negatives, so it makes my choice a little bit difficult. Okay. So y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So y minus that y, I'm using this point right here. y minus y plus minus is there. y minus 2 equals the slope, negative 3 halves, times uh, x minus negative 1. that negative 3 halves. And add 2 to both sides. When I add 2 on this side, I would like to add 2 in a way that has a common denominator. Okay. So I'll add 4 halves. y equals negative 3 halves x plus a half. get slope, and you were given two points to start with, so you use either one of those points that you, that you want as the point. Plug it into the slope-intercept form. Well, I said that wrong. Point, plug it into the point-slope form, that's what I did. Or put that stuff into the slope-intercept form and solve for b, and plug b back into the equation. I feel like terrified of this duck. Should we do another one or what? Well, I'm picking up on any of your nonverbal messages. Equation the line, given the slope and y-intercept. Oh. We do that. We hope so. It just takes knowledge of this guy here. What's this called? Linear function. Slope. It's the way that we know it is a linear function. It's kind of the definition of a linear function. Slope intercept slope. And it's got a special name, slope intercept form. Why is it called slope intercept? Because it has the slope and the intercept right in there. M is the slope. Plus b, which in this case would be plus negative 3. There it is. Just plug it in. Okay. You know the parts. You know that that's slope. You know that that's y-intercept. If I give you the slope and I give you the y-intercept, it's just plug and play. Okay. Write the equation of the line given the slope and a point on the line. Okay. A couple of things. We know the slope. We know a point on the line. And what do we do? Gonna get from there to here. Yes. Y minus seven. Y minus seven. Equals negative four minus times x minus. So it'd be like minus negative eighteen. Uh huh. To make positive. So it'd be plus eighteen. We'll just kind of shorten up that. To plus eighteen. Great. Perfect. Great and perfect. Right. So now we distribute the negative 4 ninths. We have y minus 7 equals negative 4 ninths x minus, because the negative times positive is negative. The 9 is going to cancel the 18. We even know this is 2 times 4. So it's 8. We add 7 to both sides. So minus 1. And we add 7 to negative. Questions? We do it another way. Is there another way to do this? 
Ezra. Um, you told us this last time. We're going to have a monopoly on this explanation. Yeah? You can use a silk intercept form. Yes. And put the Y and X uh -huh. and solve the Yeah. So here's the Y value. Here's the slope. Here's the X value. Plus B. Solve for B. 7 equals negative 4 nines times negative 18. Uh, cancel that. Just make it really clear that this is like a negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 4 is positive 8. That's B. Subtract 8 on both sides. B is negative 1. Y equals negative 4 nines x minus 1. And that's it. Another way. For some reason I have like a path tracker going over there. That was great. Okay, the equation of the line given two points. We just did one right before this review. We use those two points to find, Jethro? Um, or you have a question? Okay. What do you got? Y2 nines final. Okay. I'll we'll call this one two and this one one for probably the reverse of what you did, just to show you it's the same. The slope is five minus negative seven, <coughs> negative three minus six. So five plus seven. 12. No, yes, it's 12. Over negative 9. So we've got uh, negative what, four, 4 over, over three. 3. That's our slope. Mm -hmm. And we have a couple of points to choose from, either one we want. I'll choose negative 3, 5. What's the difference? y minus 5 equals negative 4 thirds times x minus negative 3. y minus 5 equals negative 4 thirds. Uh, x minus 4, because this is plus 3, and negative 4 thirds times 3 will be 4. Negative 4. Add 5 to both sides. y equals negative 4 thirds x plus 1. graph the piecewise function. So first we need a graph, or a set of axes, is what it's called. There we go. Okay, so there's some confusion over this piecewise function thing. Okay, so I'm going to Try something else. Try something to highlight, literally highlight, uh, where we're supposed to graph these functions. Okay, it's cut into pieces. It's a simple matter of the the x-axis has been cut into pieces, and that decides where each graph is drawn. Okay, so grab a highlighter. Highlight this. So for x is less than or equal to 7, let's find on the, the xy plane where x is less than or equal to 7. Where is x less than 7? So, so on the x-axis, we're at 5, 2 spaces to the right is 7, and less than that would be there, right? So here, on the right side of my highlighting, that's the cutoff. That's where the domain of this function stops. All of this other stuff, for all of infinity in, in all three directions, up, down, and left, that's where this function reigns. This function, b 
belongs here, wherever it winds up being in here. Does that make sense? So let me graph this function for values of x that are less than or equal to 7. That would be anywhere in here. Any, really, to be more clear, anywhere to the left of 7. And also, because it has the equals to, uh, also for when we're equal to 7. When we get there, we're still going to use that function when we get to 7. Now, when we get past 7, when we're larger than 7, we're going to switch over to the other function. So for all of this stuff over here, all that stuff, that's where we switch over to the other function. So here and over, we're going to use this function. Here, over. We're going to use this function. Not just a matter of graphing both those functions. <coughs> well, let's do this one. I like to graph the one that, like the uh, domain that contains the y axis because I have a y intercept that makes it easy to graph this, this line. And a y intercept of negative 4. And a slope of a negative 3 7 so that's down 1, 2, 3, and over 7 and over 7. And right there, should I make this a closed close circle or an open circle? Close. Close, because equals 7, right? That's where we equal 7. So when x is 7, and I want to know what the y value of this function will be, I'm at 7, I plug 7 in here. If it will again, I plug 7 in there, I get negative 3 minus 4. I'm at negative 7. is the output of the function. And now we can graph the line, because we know this function is a line. Any questions on that? At all? From any person in the room? For any reason? About anything? I'm begging you to ask questions if you have questions. Yes? So if it's not like greater than or equal to, it's just like greater than or less than, is this or is that line always on the y? Okay. Okay. So the reason I dotted this line is because it's not actually part of the graph. Oh. Okay. Just like the highlighting is not actually part of the graph, and this, this is not actually part of the graph. Dotted things and, and open circles are like, we're not really part of this graph. We just kind of are helping you out. We're trying to show you where you're going or where a thing is. So you do not have to draw this dotted line or anything really, just like you don't have to highlight both sides. It's just a helpful uh, you know, visual for you. Okay. Now this, this piecewise function stuff, this is really testing whether you understand that a function is just this thing that takes input and turns it into output. Right? This graph is the thing that's going to tell me the output of the function. This graph will take all of the inputs like negative 10, negative 5, negative 4, 0, 2, 5, and 7. Anything that's 7 or below, it will take the input and it will tell you the output. It'll take 0 and tell you that the output is negative 4. Put 0 in there, you get negative 4. It'll take 7. It's the one that takes the input of 7. We put 7 in there. Negative 3 7 times 7, 1 minus 4, 7 cancel, we get negative 3 minus 4, we have to get 7. Well, that, that function tells me that, that graph tells me exactly that, that's what it's supposed to do. That's what the graph is made to do, to see visually what we just did over here symbolically. And it takes all the other inputs, like negative, we put negative 7 in there, we can put anything that's negative, anything that's between 0 and 7, all of those things, those inputs go to this function, not this one, this one. When we switch over to an area that's past 7, greater than 7, that's the function that takes over, that's the graph we should see. How do I graph that? It's really up to you. As long as the end product only shows that graph 
here. Right? Just over here. So, only over here. That's where we graph this other function. And how we graph it is up to us. We could, uh, we could use the y-intercept and the slope. It's just that some of that graph we're going to have to like erase later. Okay? So I could use the, the y-intercept of, of, of negative 12. Like I'll put an open circle in this because like it's not supposed to be part of the graph. Right? Just as a, a helpful guide, I'll follow the slope now up to and over one. Two over one, two over one. Well, instead of going up two and over one a bunch, and I'm going to go over seven, right? So I should go up how much? Fourteen. Fourteen from here. Okay, so go up twelve and two more. That's fourteen. And we, what kind of circle? Open. open circle because Doesn't we're not matter. actually supposed to put seven into this function, right? But it does get awfully close to that y value. That's why we put that open circle there. And we just keep following that slope up two over one. There we go. And then I can just go ahead and say, oh, I don't need that. That's not really part of the graph. Or if we don't want to do that, we can just say, well, I just need to start at x is 7. So I'll plug 7 into this function, see what y value I would get. That's where I'll put my open circle. Okay. 2 times 7 minus 12. 14 minus 12. That's 2. There you go. 7, 2. Put an open circle. Follow the slope from there. Okay. And back to our... So when it came to like uh, absolute value of 4x minus 5 equals a number, a lot of people did well with that. Just set it equal to the positive or the negative. So let's just review that real quick. Let's set the absolute value of, say, x plus 3 or equal to 4. What does the absolute value mean? Distance away from 0. Distance away from 0, which you always take to be a positive value. Okay. Okay? That means that the inside of this absolute value could be 4, right? Absolute value of 4 is 4, isn't it? What could the inside of this absolute value also be? Negative. Negative 4. That would also be 4. So this stuff can be that. It could also come out to be that. So we set up two equations. x plus 3 equals 4, or x plus 3 equals negative 4. Those are the two possibilities for the stuff inside the absolute value. And we solve both equations. Now those are the things that x could be. So those are the values of x that you could cause it to be 4 in here or negative 4 in here. Okay, so we come over here, and the same idea is true. If you don't understand why this is, just always remember, with an absolute value equation, take the stuff inside the absolute value, as long as it's by itself on one side of the equation, that stuff, just set it equal to the other side. Right. We also set it equal to the opposite of the other side. Right? Just like with numbers, even when there's x's and stuff involved, we set it equal to the opposite of the other side. 4x minus 5 also equals, or could also equal, 3x plus 12. Two equations, two solutions. Two solutions to check as well. So we have, let's see, subtract 3x from both sides, add 5 to both sides, x equals 17. There's a possibility. Uh, we'll distribute this negative, 4x minus 5 equals uh, negative 3x minus 12. So we'll add 3x to both sides. 5 to both sides, we get 7x is equal to negative 7. So x equals negative 1. Is that enough? Are we done? No, no. We have to 
have to check the solution. We gotta go back and check. Now, you're gonna plug this x in, this is 17 in, for all the x's. Now, what are we looking for? Like, what will be telling us this solution is invalid? This won't work. Okay. If the absolute value is equal to a negative number, it's equal to a negative. That's it. If, if on the right side of the equation, or the, the side that doesn't have an absolute value, if it comes out negative, the absolute value can't be equal to a negative number, that's impossible. Okay? I can't take the absolute value and wind up with negative 4, negative 12, or whatever. Okay? So 3 times 17 plus 12, I'm just going to check the right side, because I just know that that needs to be a positive, not a negative. Okay? Well, is it going to be positive? OK. All of our work here ensures that the stuff in here will be equal to the stuff over here. Right? So we don't even really need to check that. We don't need to figure out what number this is. We just know we need, we need to know that it's going to be positive. Okay? And uh, we want to check negative 1. So 3 times negative 1 plus 12. Is that going to come out to be positive? Yep. It is. So good. Good. Two valid solutions. One of those could possibly not work. And also both of those could possibly not work. Possibly we have no solutions. We had that on the last review. Okay? Again, please, if you come to class or you leave class feeling like, oh, I didn't understand that. But you didn't ask any questions? Well, it's at least a 50-50 deal here. I cannot guess everything you need to hear from me. But if you can tell me where you're confused, why did we check that? How come that could be equal to a, a negative 4? I thought you just said that uh, it couldn't be equal to a negative. Is that confusing you? Can you explain that? Please ask questions. Ask questions if you have questions. You can't sit there silent, feeling confused, and think that you didn't play a part in that. Right? Ask questions. All right, so last time we, we ended by just getting started with direct variation. That. Then we have a little bit of a project, okay? To, uh, we're going to work together, partners, to understand scatter plots, statistical data, and finding the line of best fit, okay? So let's start with direct variation. See if we, if we know, so if we remember what it means to say, what it means to say this. Y varies. Directly with. So you remember what that means? Just y equals a x. Y equals a x. Y equals AX. Yes. No, it doesn't mean that at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 what does it mean? It's <laughs> not so good. Yes. That, um, <laughs> that all the um, numbers go through the origin. Okay, that's a, like a conclusion we can draw. So this is an equation that exists. We could certainly draw a graph of this, right? So one thing that we could say is that any equation that looks like this is linear, it's y equals mx plus b, right? The b would just always have to be zero, and therefore every, every one of these graphs is gonna go through the origin. <laughs> oh boy, Abby, did you have something to That's what you have, that's what you have? Okay. okay. Well, I guess just quite simply, here's an example of a direct variation equation, y equals 5x. It's an example. If I wanna know what y is, Take my x and multiply it by 5. That is it. There's like one step between x and y. Multiply it by 5. Another one. y equals negative 2x. There's another one. Direct variation. How about y equals x over 2? Is that direct variation? Okay. 
if it is correct variation, what's A? Two. One half. What's that? One half. One half. Yes, it's one half. What am I multiplying by? One half. Because y equals x over 2 is the same as y equals 1 half times x. Yeah? Is this correct variation? 7y equals x. Oh. Can, can be half. You divide y by 7 and then x by 7 and it becomes just like x over 2. Just like x over 2, but it's x over 7. So what is a in this case? 1, one, over, seven. one over 7 times x. Oh, Uh, no. Nothing just for you guys. In case you were wondering if it keeps egg crates in here just for fun, not only for you. Just egg crates when they come by. Uh, okay, so in this case, a is one step. If you can write it as y equals the number times x, it's direct variation. Okay. And so there's more up there. Is this direct variation? Because there's no part of direct variation that says add a number, subtract a number, just multiply x by a number to get y. That's it. That's all we can do. That is all that is involved. But uh, 3y equals 5x. Is that direct variation? Okay, if it is, then what is a equal to? 5 over 3. 5 over 3. We divide by 3 on both sides. y equals 5 thirds times x. 5 thirds. Okay, great. Recognizing direct variation equations, yes, this is direct variation. Okay. Give you. Um, I'm just going to give you a task here. I'm going to give you some data, some made up data, just making it up. All right, to have um, 15, 3, 9, 7, Negative 2, negative 6, negative 9, negative 27. I just want you to tell me if, if that's x and it correlates to that y, is this direct variation or not? Yeah. Yeah, it is? Yes, it is. Tell me why. Because you're multiplying by 3. x by 3. You multiply x by 3 every time. Every time. It's got to be every time. Is it every time? Yeah. Now is it every time? Hold on. No. no. Is it direct variation? No, no, no. no, there is not one number that you multiply x by to get y. Okay? Let me make it a little trickier. Let's address whether or not this data set is direct variation. I heard uh, I heard Richard first, right? No, it was, no, it was Peter first. That's right. It's not. It's not. How did you figure that it's not? Well, because I figured out that you multiplied everything by 2.37, but negative 2 times 2.37 is negative 4.74. Or 75. Is that true? 
Yes. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't hit 10 for that. That's a mess of the last one. Did I type that one down wrong? Oh, I did. Okay. So negative 4.74, I should have been. Okay, well, I mean, even with my mistake, we kind of accomplished what I wanted. It still can't be because. Even if I fixed it? Yeah, because you let 5 times the number in Okay, there's another example. If I if I multiply five by this number that I'm supposed to be able to multiply to get y, then I should. Well, if that's true, then this should be just the opposite of that. Yeah, it's not. I mean, even that. It's a great observation. A two-point observation. Okay. So what are you saying? Uh, like for the very kind of last one, negative five and stuff, you can't get uh, eleven point seven two into the two because you can't. Take a five and um, uh, anything multiplied by five, you can't get it. It's either going to be a zero or a five. Uh, no. <laughs> what I'm saying is, or what Justin is saying is, here's what we're supposed to be able to do y equals a times x. We're supposed to yeah. take, take any x, multiply it by the number, okay? And if we look at this example, mm -hmm. that number should be. Right? One times some number is 2.37, so this number should be 2.37. Okay. Even if I don't know that, you don't have to know that the number is 2.37 to understand what Justin's saying. He's saying that if this is direct variation and I can multiply x by some number and get y, let's pretend that I multiply 5 by that number to get 11.85. Yeah. Right? Now, if I take that same number and don't multiply by 5 and multiply by negative 5, I should just get the opposite of this. Okay. Right? I should just get the opposite, but I don't. Yeah. So there's another reason why. Yeah? Um, so if it was wrong, like negative five is wrong, does that mean that they like the point within path to the origin? It means students, students, staff, and visitors, we're now conducting an earthquake drill. Please drop, cover, and hold on for 60 seconds. Yeah, I think we have no problem. Jethro, Jethro's question <laughs> was, if, if this isn't working out and we don't have direct variation here, does that mean we have to go to the origin? Probably. What we're saying here is if there is an equation that can take x and turn it into y, there, there may not, not, if there is one, it's probably not very nice, and it definitely is not of this form. Okay. Whether or not that graph goes to the origin, well, I don't know all the data. I don't know exactly what equation can govern this input to this output. But it's not this, right? Maybe it's, uh, you know, plus b. Maybe that way it won't. Maybe we could throw that on there. Maybe it needs to be like an x squared. Or maybe it needs to be, you know, some other kind of a rule. But the thing we know for sure is that y equals ax is not an equation that will work for this data. That's all we know. So whether or not it goes to the, the, the origin, can't know for sure, probably not. Uh, but I don't know for sure. Okay. So it's if there's an equation that takes that those x's and turns them into those y's, it's not y equals a times x. Something else. It looks different from that. Okay? Let's see if we can figure out what kinds of things in the world have direct variation? Gas. How do you mean? Price per gallon. The price per gallon yeah. equals like how much it costs. Okay, so you're saying you take the price per gallon, which is that your constant? Or, uh, yeah. That's, that's your a. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's the a. Okay. Uh, so y equals Price per gallon times yeah, x. x, which is gas, so gallons, right? And so this would be your total price cost, yeah, whatever. Direct variation. So the total cost of a let's say fill up is well, I'll say it's varies directly with direct. That's the word directly with what? What's that? How many gallons you buy? 
right, varies directly with the number of gallons uh, purchased direct variation. Okay. Another way that, that is more common to read about or hear people say is uh, total cost of a fill up is directly proportional. Have you ever heard somebody say something's directly proportional to something else? Here, I just went on a Google search, searched the news for the phrase directly proportional to. Let's see what came up. Uh, brain learning ability is directly proportional to curiosity. Right? What does that mean? It means the more curious I am, the more ability I have to learn. Right? Learning ability goes up, apparently, they're, what they're, I don't know if they're exactly saying this, but what they're trying to say is as my curiosity goes up, I can multiply that by a factor of whatever their, their A is in this scenario, right? like two. I don't know what the units of curiosity or learning ability are, but if I were to multiply my curiosity by some number, apparently I could get my learning ability. Right? So that's what they're saying. They're really saying when curiosity goes up, learning ability goes up. Right? That's what they're saying. Uh, let's see. Uh, 10 to 12 directly proportional to the team's winning percentage. Do you think that's true? Maybe not exactly true. Not, not precisely accurate. But what they're trying to communicate is exactly what this equation is saying. Y equals A times X. They're trying to say that if you take their winning percentage, oh, 75% winning percentage, right? And multiply it by some constant number, it could tell you how many people attended you know, the following week or something like that. Right? And as their percentage drops, what's also going to drop? The attendance. Who wants to see a losing team? Well, not very many people, right? That's what they're saying, directly proportional. Uh, inversely proportional. What's inversely proportional? Oh, inversely proportional. That's something else. That would be y equals a divided by x. That's inversely proportional. Method of funding public education and federal funds should be distributed in a manner that is inversely proportional to the comparative tax, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what the rest of that says. That's a long sentence. Method of funding public education. Federal funds should be distributed in a manner that is inversely proportional to the comparative tax. Something about taxes. So as taxes go up, the amount of money that's distributed from the federal level should go down. Same thing. Okay. Um, this is about a video game. Uh, the weight of the player is directly proportional to the movement or speed at which it moves. Okay, what does that mean? Directly proportional to its movement or the speed at which it moves? The more you weigh, the slower you go. I assume. I think that's, what, that's, that's what it is. What's this directly proportional? Directly proportional. That means like if, if you move slow, you weigh more. If you move fast, you weigh less. That's what you would maybe hope. Kind of seems like it would be, but that's not what I'm saying. Saying that the that the weight of the player is directly proportional to the movement or the speed at which it moves. So that means that the faster you move, the more you weigh. That's apparently what this is saying. Do you think that's true? No. That doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem right. It seems kind of like if I'm in a video game, I'm running faster. It kind of like it weighs less. That's not really making any sense. Yeah, because if you put put me in, in a Miller and, uh, and stuff, I weigh more Miller. Miller right. going to outrun me in 10 times out of 10. So yeah, our intuition about this so seems to contradict. Well, maybe what do they mean? <laughs> Real time. Do they mean directly proportional? Maybe they do. Maybe that is how this game works. It takes your speed, multiplies by a constant, and it, well, it makes you heavier the faster you run. That's whack. It seems like a proportional. It would be something else. It's the opposite. Yeah. It would be Inversely proportional. And that's, what that, that's what we think that should be. That's kind of would be our intuition about it. So you're taking it. I would open this, but opening unknown links in a classroom for a keyboard. Is 
really risky business. Okay, so we'll just say, from what we're reading here, it seems like we are thinking you know, it should be inversely proportional. What does that mean, inversely proportional? Well, it means what you think about, that you think that the faster you run, the less you should weigh. That the bigger your speed, big speed, means smaller weight. Right? Directly proportional means bigger speed, bigger weight. Right? Directly proportional means bigger curiosity, bigger learning ability. Directly proportional means bigger winning percentage, bigger turnout. Okay? Inversely proportional is what we're thinking, feeling about this situation right here. It feels like bigger speed should be smaller weight. No, that's just how we feel about it. But that may not be the case. I don't know, these are video game developers, pretty smart. Probably mean directly proportional. Maybe that's good. Maybe when you're like, because of the code and the mechanics of the game, if it were inversely proportional, the faster you run, the less you weigh. So the faster you run, the less you weigh. The faster you can run, the less you weigh. The faster you can run, the less you weigh. And you can just like run infinitely fast. Maybe the faster you run, it makes you weigh more. It kind of starts to slow you down and gives you a top end to the speed that you can go. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. But there are some examples, just from news stories, just from searching for, is directly proportional to. And directly proportional to means exactly the same thing as very directly with. Just different words in a little bit of a different order. It means the same thing. Okay? So, let's try this. Y varies directly with X. Y equals AX. Another way to say that is uh, Y is directly proportional to X. Same thing. Um, bullet points here. All direct variation graphs. What? Go through the origin. attention to what I say and what I write down. Great. Um, but if I have, uh, if you're given a table and you want to figure out is this direct variation, I mean, how did you do that? Kaden, okay, how did you do that? For that table, I asked if it was direct variation. What went through your head? How did you figure out that the number would have to be 2.37 for A? Well, for starters, I just, I went with a guess or uh, conclusion that 1 times 2.37 is going to be 2.37. Okay. So then I used my calculator, plugged it into 5, and it mm -hmm. turned out to be that, so that I just did that for the rest of them, mm -hmm. and it didn't work out. It didn't, and it stopped working at negative 2. And it would also not work at negative 5. Figure out what that number is, right? In general, if y is equal to ax, you see it just, we've rewritten equations and formulas already. What should A be equal to? Like in any direct variation equation, I should be able to find A by doing what? Just look at this equation right here. Solve for A. Dividing by one. Divide by what? Y. Divide by X. How about X? Because that will leave A by itself. Yeah. Right? Divide uh, Y by X. Divide Y by X. That should always give you A, shouldn't it? Ah, okay, so if I ever want to find A, A is always equal to y divided by x. So if I like an example, if I told you that y varies directly with x, and that when x is 5, y is 30, can you write the equation y equals ax? Mm -hmm. We can figure out what that is. A equals 6. A equals 6. If y varies directly with x, and this is a point on the graph, or this is the solution to the equation, where when x equals 5, y equals 30, then it would have to be 6. y equals 6 times x. That's the equation we must come up with. Okay. All right, so we're going to answer that homework. I'm going to give you some other homework with this data set.
All right, so what you're looking at, information about the top 30 vehicles sold in 2013. Top 30. So the top two were actually pickup trucks. All right, so uh, 2013, there is this uh, construction boom and maybe some independently owned construction guys uh, were buying trucks and kind of put trucks at the top. Maybe trucks are number one every year, I don't know. Number one and two are the F-Series and the Silverado. And then it just gives you information about all of these different vehicles. How much they cost? What's their fuel efficiency in the city? What's their fuel efficiency on the highway? How much do they weigh? How much power do they have? How much horsepower do they have? How much torque do they have? Okay. Now, do you think these numbers have anything to do with each other? Like, as we compare one set of data, like weight, to power, do you think that the weight of a vehicle Tell you something about its power? Yeah. Do you think that they're related in some way? A little bit. Huh? Maybe a little bit. Oh, you got it. Do you think that there's other, like two other columns that are related more so? The weight, power. Weight, power, and torque? It could be power and torque. Weight and torque. Uh, how about weight and fuel efficiency? Weight and in the, in the miles per gallon that you get? How about fuel efficiency city and fuel efficiency highway? Do they have? Do you think they are closely related to each other? I think so. Fuel efficiency. Yeah, they're calling for the price. Uh, the fuel efficiency and price, we, we don't try to do three things. That gets tricky. So maybe pick one fuel efficiency and price. Do you think that's more expensive the car, the better the fuel efficiency? Maybe. We're going to find that out. We're going to see if there's what's called correlation between these data sets. Okay. So bring these to class next time. Pick two things that you think are related, or pick two things you think are very, or, or like not very closely related, not very closely correlated. All right? That are like opposites? Or yeah, that, well, well. That don't make sense. Well, ahead. here's a couple things that, are, that don't seem to be correlated, like uh, the number of buttons on my shirt and how much I make per year. <laughs> now, most shirts have about the same number of buttons, so I probably have the same amount of buttons as Bill Gates has. Really tall. Right? <coughs> that doesn't mean that it has anything to say about how much money I make, which is less than Bill Gates in case you're curious. Yeah, the more buttons are in the